Yeah. Well, we can. Just let us take a moment up there, and that's all right. That's all right. We good? Okay. All righty. Well, we just came off of David and Goliath. And uh, I love that story. You know, God reminds us of his strength, um, that he's with us. Um, he's strengthening us. And so uh, this morning we're about to deal with the fallout of that great battle, of that great moment of David striking down Goliath. Sorry, I'm really distracted. <laughs> I think everybody else is too. <laughs> I just want to make sure everybody's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay. We're good. All right. Um, so, Goliath, if you remember from last week, taunted the armies of Israel for 40 days. 40 days coming out, taunting them day after day after day, and, and, and mocking them. And the armies fl- fled, they fled in terror. Uh, they were terrified of Goliath and what was happening. Um, and David comes on the scene, and he sees this invincible giant. He sees this man defying the armies of the living God, and David was unafraid. He was unafraid, saying, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who dares defy the armies of the living God? And we remember from that, from from how David saw the situation, we think back to how uh, David was described as having beautiful eyes. And he has eyes that, that could see, that could perceive, that had the perspective of Almighty God. He saw how God delivered him in the past. Remember, he said, God's delivered me from the lions, from the bears of the past. He is going to deliver me again from this present danger, from this giant. So we see that David had this spiritual perspective of God. And, and he said, who is this Philistine? He's but a man. God will deliver him into my hand this day. And remember the battle, when it actually happened, um, it lasted mere seconds. So after David got the approval of King Saul... David went out and he confronted the giant, Goliath, um, and David told Goliath exactly what he would do to him, and then he proceeded to do that, running towards him, bringing out the sling, hitting him square between the eyes, sinking into his forehead, causing Goliath to fall face down because Goliath was moving forward too, and then David ran and removed Goliath's head from his body and held it up before everybody. And so the Philistines, uh, before they could realize what had happened, their champion's head was being held up by a shepherd boy declaring powerfully that there is a God in Israel, and he is the living God. And so they fled, the Philistines fled in terror before Israel, um, and Israel, the armies of the living God, regaining their courage, seeing the shepherd's boy faith, uh, his faith, they began to strike down the Philistines all the way to Gath and to the very gates of Ekron. They chased them back to two of the five great cities of the Philistines uh, called the Pentapolis. Um, and so we've got a picture here of where the armies of Israel chased them to. And so you see these are the five cities of the Philistines. There's Ekron and Gath um, just before the coastline cities over there. So they chased them all the way uh, towards the coast, and the Philistines were a coastal people. Um, and so that's where they chased them to. And, and then w- this is where it brings us where we are this morning in chapter 17, because we didn't quite finish 17. We still got verses 55 uh, to 58 to finish up. But we stop there because it leads us right into chapter 18. So beginning in verse 55, as soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. So David, we know, is in Saul's service playing music at the the recommendation of another servant. Um, And so um, Saul really didn't need to know David's family lineage. Um, He just had his servants take care of acquiring this boy. They're like, hey, it's the son of Jesse. 
Um, and, and he's like, go, go get him. And, but he didn't really have to remember uh, that he was the son of Jesse. Um, and so Saul asked another servant, who is this guy? They're like, we don't know. Um, but now it matters who David is. It matters who's, who David's father is. Why does it matter? Because of the reward promised by Saul to the one who slays the giant. The reward that David, if you remember last week, was asking everybody in the army about. What is this reward? Tell me again. What is this reward about? And Saul promised to give whoever slew the giant great riches. Saul promised to give his daughter in marriage to whoever slayed this giant. Uh, Saul, Saul promised that his, his house would be free. He would be, he would be tax-free, the household um, of whoever slayed this giant. So this is no small reward. And if you remember, David went around asking everybody about what the reward was that was promised. And so uh, this, was, this was no secret. Everybody was talking about it. And this is actually how word got back to King Saul. Um, so Saul heard, okay, David's been asking about this. Saul brings him in. Hey, what do you want to do? And he's like, I want to kill him. And, and so, I mean, everybody uh, knows the reward. Everybody knows. So Saul is, I mean, he's kind of held to this promise that he made now. Um, and so uh, things are about to change dramatically for David's life. So the obscure shepherd boy from the country, the youngest of eight, who was secretly anointed by Samuel to be king, we know that. Saul doesn't know that. Um, he's a most unlikely shepherd boy, um, and he's now on track to becoming king. And so what, what before seemed a total long shot, youngest of eight sons, shepherd, taking care of the sheep, there's no way this kid's going to be king. And now all of a sudden, it seems like it's a possibility. So this event catapulted him, him into the public eye, eye, and it's setting him on this long and arduous journey of becoming king. And verse 57 of chapter 17 goes on. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. In chapter, and it leads now, it leads straight into chapter 18, 1 Samuel 18, verse 1. As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Okay, so there is something captivating about David. The Spirit of God is upon him. David, we read, he has good presence. He's ruddy, he's handsome, he has beautiful eyes, but most importantly, he has a genuine faith that's marked by his confidence in God. And we saw from chapter 14 that this is the same heart that Jonathan has. When Jonathan said uh, to his armor bearer, it may be that the Lord will give them to us this day. The, the, the multitude of the army of the Philistines, it may be. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And the Lord delivered them that day. Likewise, David proclaimed in chapter 17, the Lord to Goliath will deliver you into my hand, for the Lord saves not with spear or swords. Weapons and numbers don't matter with God. He is the God who saves. And both Jonathan and David were warriors, and they had confidence in God. They were soul brothers. At the deepest level of their being, their souls resonated. When Jonathan looked on David, he saw himself. He saw how David carried himself. And he resonated with him. My soul brother. My brother from another mother. Yeah, this is, David's my boy. His soul was knit to the soul of David. He just knew it right off the bat, man. This is, we're the same. And we'll get more into this in a moment. But verse 2 goes on. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. So a little over a month ago when we're talking and we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 14, I told you to remember this, that when we read there was hard fighting against the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he attached him to himself. That is exactly what Saul is doing right now with David. A valiant man, he is attaching him to his retinue. And when the king orders you to be with him, there is no objecting. 
He would not let David go home to his father's house. The king had now taken him. David is no longer bivocational. He can't go feed his father's sheep and then come play music for the king. He is, he is stuck with Saul now. He could not go home. And then verse 3, something incredible takes place. Verse 3, then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. As a son of Saul, Jonathan is prince. He is the first prince and heir to the throne. He has the finest equipment available and a status that, that's held and that's seen through his wardrobe. And here before him is this lowly, poorly dressed shepherd boy with the heart of a lion, with the heart of a lion. And Jonathan sees David and loves David as his own soul. So, he, so he's stripping himself of his royalty, of his royal garments. He's covenanting with David and clothing David with his status, his belongings, his strength, giving him armor, a rich robe, instruments of war, a bow and a sword and a belt. David is transformed in this moment from a lowly shepherd boy to a princeling in the court of Saul. And it's done in the most tender and loving way by Jonathan who looks on David and he loves David as his own soul taking his own clothing and clothing David with it. He wants to care for David. He wants to to clothe him in a way fitting of David's heart. For David has the heart of a king. He had the heart of a king long before he ever becomes king. And Jonathan sees it. He sees how David carries himself. And he knows so much from hearing so little from young David because David speaks the words that are on Jonathan's heart, words of faith words of devotion, words of worship of God. And like Jonathan, David is also a great warrior. And we just have to pause here and recognize that what Jonathan does here for David is exactly what Christ has done for us. Jonathan loves with godly love. And godly love is this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he clothed us with his garments. He clothed us with his righteousness. And in Christ, we have become royalty. Sons and daughters of the living God. We're royal priesthood of all believers, as the Apostle Peter says. We're sons and daughters of God, of the King. We're adopted and we're clothed with kingly garments. The very garments of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, who by his blood he has purchased us and he has clothed us. And in him we take up our spiritual armor. We we take up our, our shield of faith. We take up the the breastplate of righteousness, shoes fitted with the gospel of peace, the helmet of salvation, the belt of truth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we take that and we're prepared for for battle. We have spiritual armor, for we are in a spiritual battle. Our enemies are not flesh and blood, we are told. They are the rulers, the powers, the, the principalities, the rulers of the air, the spiritual entities of this present darkness. Those are our enemies that wage war against the things of God. When we follow Jesus, we are behind enemy lines. Here on earth, we are behind enemy lines. So we must be clothed, we must be armored up. And when we are, we become targets of our enemy. David's life is not going to get easier by answering the call of God. By no means. David's life is, a, is about to become far more complicated. There's going to be far more pressures on him, far more anxieties and stress. He's not out in the fields with the sheep anymore. He's dealing with things of national consequence. And yes, he will experience great victories and adulation, but he's also going to experience fear, hatred, fleeing for his life from the very one who should be celebrating his victories. Because the spirit of envy has a way of creeping in and ruining the good things that God is doing, especially for the person who's being overcome by envy. But the purposes of God will still move forward as he is continuing his work. And, in, in through, in, and through it, he's refining David in this time. And we know it began in the hills with the sheep and the bears and the lions, 
but it's being intensified as he's, he's being ripped from his home in service of a jealous king who has become a tyrant. But in the, that court of Saul, David, we see now, has someone who dearly loves him. The very son of Saul, no less. Verse 5 goes on, And David went out and was, success, was successful wherever Saul sent him, so that Saul set him over the men of war. And this was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. As they were coming home, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out, of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and this saying displeased him. He said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. So envy, insecurity, and then paranoia took hold of Saul. The women were singing and dancing for him, for Saul, but he couldn't hear it. He could not receive their love because David had been ascribed more victories than himself. He was so self-absorbed that he could not celebrate the deliverance that God gave to Israel. Saul, as he has done before, made it about himself. He always makes it about himself. And this is where Saul is truly and unfortunately so much more relatable than David is at this point. We're amazed at David. Well, David, look at his faith. But Saul, we're like, yeah, yeah, we get that. I can see how this, this song didn't go over well with Saul. That was probably a bad idea by the women to sing that song. Did, didn't somebody think, hey, Saul, Saul might not like this song? He, he, he might not be, be too keen on him being ascribed less kills than David. And we know that, right? We can see that. We know at our worst, we're not so different than Saul. In fact, on a regular basis, we might be more like Saul than David. Why? Because on a regular basis, we make it more about ourselves than we do about God. If Saul had made it about God, he would be rejoicing in God's deliverance. He would say to the women, don't sing about me. Sing about God. He is the one who deliver delivered us this day. But he does not say that. He does not say that. He makes it about himself. And... and it ruins the good things that God is doing. But when we give God the credit, when we give credit where credit is due, we say, no, I, just, man, I was just here. God did it. God delivered us. When we do that, it changes everything. So that it's about God and not about us. So that, so that when someone else gets all the credit for a victory that maybe we should have got some credit for, we won't go and stew over it and allow it to creep in and cause hatred and jealousy in our hearts. And this is what is happening in the heart of Saul. He is giving into his worst instincts. And now he is harboring jealous and murderous thoughts towards David. The one who took down the giant. Because the women sang a song for Saul and gave David more credit. And Saul perhaps knew in his heart of hearts that actually David deserved more credit than he did. David was the one who slew Goliath. And then the paranoia crept in. What more can this guy have but the kingdom? Verse 10 goes on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had a spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. Notice here, God is protecting David. I don't know why he stayed for the second throw, but God, <laughs> God's protecting David, and he, he's got some quick reflexes here. Second, notice that, that Saul is stewing in his jealous, envious, paranoid thoughts, and then in that stewing, he was vulnerable to spiritual attack. That's when the harmful spirit rushed upon Saul. 
Right? Th- these are times when we need to be on guard. Take our thoughts captive. Take them captive. And don't allow the, the enemy to infiltrate. Man, man to, to bring us down. To bring us down into these dark thoughts. Man, we've got to put on the helmet of salvation. And set our minds on things above, on the things of God. And guard ourselves against these this envious thoughts, these, these things that are going to bring us down. And in this, in this moment with Saul, we see that God is accomplishing his plans by sending the Spirit. But it's Saul's heart that is corrupt. Make no mistake about that. So, so this, is, this is a both-and scenario, what's happening here. Saul is corrupt. He's stewing. God sends the Spirit to put him over the edge. Saul is Hard in his heart, and God is giving him a push, just like God did with Pharaoh, ensuring that Pharaoh would indeed send the Israelites away from Egypt and not change his mind and decide to keep them and you know lighten up their labor, you know, say, Oh, we're gonna be all cool, you know, and, and he's gonna change his mind. Because God knew that that down the road Pharaoh would turn again and enslave the people. So God hardened Pharaoh's heart just as Pharaoh was hardening his heart, and Pharaoh, because of that, drove the people away. So likewise, Saul's heart is corrupted, and God is giving him a push to drive David away. Because God would not allow David to become a slave of Saul. Saul took David. He would not let him go home. But God's plan was not for David to be sitting as a captive in Saul's house playing music all day. David is going to be a king. And in order for this to happen, he must not be in the clutches of Saul. He must be out leading men. Look what happens in verse 12. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. This is where David truly shines. And he's a leader of men. He seems to have this great military mind that some people are born with, but we know that in David's case, this is the equipping of God by the Spirit of God, to give David the necessary tools for his calling to become king. And there were many battles to fight. Verse 14, And David had success in all of his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great success, he stood in fearful awe of him. But all Israel and and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. So Saul is a fearful man. He always has been. And it causes him to be weak and disobedient to God in many ways. When we are self-consumed as Saul is, we become fearful for very good reasons. For we are fragile. We don't know what we should do all the time. We don't make the best decisions. We're insecure because we should be. We're we're broken. We're fallen. We, we say things we don't want to say. We do things we don't want to do. So, so by being consumed with himself, Saul is fearful. But contrary to that, when we are consumed by God, when we're consumed, when we're consumed by the things of God, then we are strong. For God is our strength. God is our joy. He is our peace. He is our hope. So the contrast couldn't be starker here. David looking to God. And taking down giants and leading thousands. And Saul, consumed with himself, is stewing in his house, plotting murder and afraid of losing what he has. It goes on. Saul comes up with a plan. Verse 17. Then Saul said to David, Here is my elder daughter, Merib. I will give her to you for a wife. Only be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul thought, Let not my hand be against him, but let the hand of the Philistine be against him. And David said to Saul, Who am I? And who are my relatives, my father's clan in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But at that time, when Merib, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, she was given to Adriel, the Meholathite, for a wife. So Saul, he's going back on his word, and then he's pivoting his plan, because verse 20 here. Now Saul's daughter, Michal, or Michael, or Michal, Michal, In Hebrew, however you want to say it, people say it differently. Uh, We're going to say Michal. She loved David. So Saul's son loves David. And now Saul's younger daughter 
she loves David too. And all the people love David. And Saul is becoming ever more insecure and fearful. And strangely, this is often what happens to dictators. They become paranoid and insecure, despising and killing people whom they deem as a threat to their authority. So Saul is he's showing these signs of jealousy, insecurity, and paranoia, being afraid of David, wanting to kill him. But we know that David now has two inner people in the court of Saul. Saul's firstborn son and his daughter who love him. And they're going to look out for him. And they're going to protect David from their crazy dad, which we'll see later in 1 Samuel. Moving on, Michal loved David, and they, and they told Saul. And the thing pleased him. Saul thought, let me give her to him, that she may be a snare for him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, you shall now be my son-in-law. And Saul commanded his servants, speak to David in private and say, Behold, the king has delight in you, and all the servants love you. Now then, become the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spoke these words, those words in the ears of David. And David said, Does it seem to you a little thing to become the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and have no reputation? Okay, why is David so hesitant here? Well, it was a custom for men to pay a bride price for a bride, um, especially if the girl was a virgin. And especially if she, she had higher social status, which in this case is a princess. So we don't know the exact price that would have been appropriate for David to pay him, uh, but it would have been substantial. Uh, 50 shekels of silver is one number that's found in Scripture for a bride price. Um, and we know that at this time, the wages of an unskilled laborer, like a shepherd boy, would have been about 12 shekels a year. So he would have had to save up 50 shekels, at least, to pay this bride price. So we kind of can understand, this is not a small thing. This is not a small price uh, that's expected to be paid for the hand of, of Michal. Verse 24, and the servants of Saul told him, thus and so did David speak. Then Saul said, thus shall you say to David, the king desires no bride price except... A hundred foreskins of the Philistines, that he may be avenged of the king's enemies. Now, Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Okay, so I'm really glad it's not Family Sunday. <laughs> You're not going to have to explain to your kids what a foreskin is on the drive home. But this is quite the task, man, that Saul is giving to David. Cutting off the foreskins of a hundred Philistines. He's going to have to kill him to do this. <laughs> and so this is what Saul knows. So he's hoping that in the process of, of this, that a Philistine is going to take care of the job that Saul is unable to do himself. So I don't want to hear anybody complaining about their in-laws today. <laughs> They're not as crazy as this guy, okay? <laughs> And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. Before the time had expired, David arose and went along with his men and killed 200 of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, which were given in full number to the king, that he might become the king's son-in-law. What a wonderful story. <laughs> Try not to think too much about how it all happened, because it's gross. Like, did David have a bag? Just drop it. You make a necklace. Give it to Saul, man. Yeah, this is brutal, man. This is brutal. But David does it, and he brings back twice the number that Saul asked for, which let's, let's focus on that instead of what it actually is. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew 5:41. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. And the context of that is that the occupying Romans at the time could force anyone to carry their supplies for one mile with them along the road. But Jesus says, don't go just one with them, go two with them. David doubles what's asked of him. David doesn't just do the bare minimum, he goes above and beyond. As followers of Christ, man, this is our calling 
as well, to not simply be those who do the quota, but seek to go above and beyond the thing, things that God has set before us. For we know whom it is that we work for. It is for Christ. It's for the Lord. And so we serve our leaders, whether they're good leaders or bad leaders. We serve them beyond what they ask. Saul has, has taken David, and he has not allowed him to go home, but David still serves Saul above and beyond. The call of Christ is to serve the Roman soldiers, to go two miles with them, the, the soldiers who could beat the people physically, force them into submission. And he says, don't do the bare minimum for them. Go the extra mile. Why? Because no matter how broken people are, and they are, people are not our enemy. They are our mission field. And we are called to love our enemies, to pray for those who persecute us. And I know some of you would rather go gather 200 foreskins than love your enemy. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not a small thing. It's not a trite thing. It's not a thing for the cowardly or the prideful. Instead, to love your enemies is for the courageous and it's for the humble. It is for those who trust in God, who trust in God, that he is the judge. He will deal out justice. He will deal out vengeance as he sees fit, for he is the only one who is worthy of that. And therefore, in trusting in him, humbling ourselves before him, we have died to ourselves and we become born again, children of the living God. That is how we can forgive when it seems impossible to forgive and practice radical love because we are those who have received the incredible, radical love of God that he would send his only son for us. In Christ, we are receivers of supernatural love. We are those who have been forgiven. We are those who have been showed grace when we didn't deserve it, and we're called to do the same. Saul didn't deserve David's love and loyalty, but David went above and beyond for him all the same. Verse 27, And Saul gave him his daughter Michal for a wife, but when Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, loved him, Saul was even more afraid of David. So Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the commanders of the Philistines came out to battle, and as often as they came out, David had more success than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed in chapter. So God was with David. There is no question about that. And it was obvious to everybody. And Saul knew in his heart that David would one day be king. And Saul would go to every length to try to stop that from happening. But he failed. Though he tried his best to take David down, he could not. For none can stop the word of God from going forth and bringing about what he has promised to accomplish. Kings and rulers cannot stop God's plans. False prophets Liars and deceivers, they cannot stop God's plans from going forward. Satan and his legions cannot stop God's plans. God will bring about what he said. He will bring about his plans of redemption of the world. And none can stand before him. And that is why we trust in him. That is why we fix ourselves upon the rock that is Christ the one who is immovable, whom no one can thwart or uproot. And when it seems the storms are closing in on us, we take hope, we take faith, because we know that none can stand before him. Though we lose life and limb, we know victory is ours in Christ. So this chapter, I think, brings, brings us back again to the warning of Samuel. If you've been with us through this whole series, you remember the warning of Samuel about the people demanding a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, Samuel, God tells Samuel to warn the people, this is what a king is going to do. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. And it's this long list uh, uh, saying over and over again, the king will take, 
the king will take, the king will take. He will take the best of your young men, and he will put them to his work. He will make them commanders of thousands and fifties, as he did with David. He will take, and you'll be his slaves. And, and, and yet the people thought they knew better than God. They said, no, we shall have a king over us and be like all the other nations. And he will judge us and fight our battles. And in their stubbornness and in their arrogance, they rejected God as their king in exchange for a man. And the temptation to do this is a prevalent one. And if we just had the right leader, we could give him all the power and he could fix all the problems, right? That's how, that, that's how we want that to happen. But they didn't realize that the right and the just king who is worthy of all the power does not exist on this earth. For God is our only king. He is the only one who is capable And until we put our trust and our hope in him, we will be deceived and led astray by earthly solutions for cosmic problems. We overestimate ourselves and underestimate the corrupting power of sin. We are not to be trusted. We all need accountability in our life. We need people in our life who can tell us no, who can correct us in love, who can disagree with us. Saul is a warning to us all to not think so highly of ourselves or of others that we are beyond corrupting tendencies. That if we have unchecked power, we will do good. We see that Saul's become a taker. He began as the reluctant king, and he's transformed into a domineering king and is on track to becoming a paranoid king. It's a pattern that's seen in all unchecked dictators which is a reminder, a declaration to the world that we are not good. We are not capable. We cannot usher in utopia as long as broken people with a sin nature are here in charge. But there is another king. There is one who is worthy, one whom we can put all our hope and trust in, one whom we give everything for, for he has emptied himself for us. He is not a king like other kings. He is our good king. He is the good shepherd. He is the bread of life. He is the great I am, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the living one. He is the king whom just as Jonathan stripped himself to clothe David, so our king stripped himself of his heavenly dwelling, of his glory, taking on flesh and coming as a servant. And with his eyes fixed on the Father, he went to Golgotha to bear our shame on the cross, being stripped naked, mocked, and nailed to a tree, he emptied himself, bearing what was not his to bear, but by his love he endured to death, so that his beloved, you and me, may receive his garments of righteousness. We may be forgiven, just as Isaiah prophesied would take place in Isaiah 61.10, where he writes, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up, before all the nations. This morning, God is causing righteousness and praise to sprout up among all the nations. He has clothed us with garments of salvation. He has covered us with his robe of righteousness. And this prophetic word is fulfilled in the work of Christ. For we are not only covered by his blood, but we are raised to new life because on the third day he rose again. And he said that those who belong to him will rise again as well sharing in his resurrection. So we are clothed not only with his righteousness, but also in garments of salvation. We're those who are saved by grace through faith and the one who came, whom our hearts longed for. And this youth David will face trial after trial after trial, and he endured because he kept his eyes fixed on the God of salvation, the God who delivers not by sword or spear, the God who saves David is beginning a journey to becoming a king who will point not to himself, but to the one who's coming after him, the one who will be greater than him. And God is shaping 
and refining and forming David into this king. But he will face trial after trial. But he is clothed. He is clothed by the Spirit of God. He's made ready. He's equipped. And we too are called to be sons and daughters of God who point not to ourselves, but to the living God, the one who came and overcame, who is the hope and the joy of our souls, our beloved Lord Jesus, who has promised to come again, who has promised to be with us in this life. So when we too face trials of various kinds, we are not surprised. For those who have come before us have also faced trials of various kinds. And we know that those who kept their eyes fixed on God were not put to shame, but they were kept hidden in his wings. So find your strength this morning in him. Find your covering in him. Find your hope and your peace in him as we keep our, keep our eyes fixed on Christ, the author of salvation, the redeemer of our souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you loved us first. Lord Jesus, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Father, may we live with our eyes fixed on you, trusting in you alone, for only you are worthy of all of our trust. So God, may we be those who are like Jonathan, who will seek to clothe those around us with your love. May we be like David, who trusts in you in all things, who goes above and beyond, even for our enemies, that we in some way can demonstrate Christ to those you've put in our lives. Help us to do that, Lord. Help us to find our confidence in you and our hope in you. Give us spiritual eyes to see. Give us a heavenly perspective. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Victorious, you are the only.